so they issued a warrant for violating my supervised release. And I was just pissed off, so I just said, hey, catch me if you can. When the FBI came to arrest Mitnick in December 1992, he was gone. He was on the run because he didn't trust the government and he didn't trust the FBI and he believed um, if he talked to them they would put him back in jail and he would be right back in solitary and he'd do anything not to be back in that cell again. It was, a, it was an adventure. I went to a town, went to a hotel, you know, found a place to live, found employment at a law firm and just started my life from scratch but of course I had to build a past and I did that myself by you know built fake references uh, built an, an identity so I can support myself what I did is I downloaded all the information of everybody that graduated with a computer science degree and then I looked for a name that I would like and I saw this name Eric Weiss and I knew that Eric Weiss was the real name of Harry Houdini. As I was working at this law firm in Denver um, for about a year, a little bit over a year, under the name of Eric Weiss. Yeah. And what my downfall was is I could yeah. continue to still engage in my hobby of hacking. Mitnick could break into um, a system by calling people on his cell phone while he was walking home, conning managers, secretaries, even executives into information. Kevin was systematically attacking uh, the computers of uh, some of the world's largest cellular telephone manufacturers, and he was stealing their source code. Mitnick was now hacking with a purpose, to keep one step ahead of the law. By hacking into mobile phone companies and copying the blueprints to their phones, he was able to make untraceable calls. He was able to elude us by virtue of, of knowing the uh, telephone and the computer systems well enough to, to know what could be figured out and how quickly it would take to do that. So he definitely played the systems well. He never had any idealized goal or any, any real objective other than to keep hacking and keep staying one step ahead of the FBI. Mitnick's notoriety soon spread. In the summer of 1994, the FBI's failure to catch their internet outlaw became front page news, thanks to journalist John Markoff. It was simply a good story. I mean, here is a guy who has been arrested before, who's managed to use his skills to avoid law enforcement. I mean, that's, that's a good yarn. He created the myth of Kevin Mitnick, the John Dillinger of cyberspace. I think there were more than 60 unsourced allegations stated as fact, such as breaking into NORAD, climbing false news story about Security Pacific Bank, about wiretapping the FBI. Markov's portrait of Mitnick tapped into the growing fears of businesses and members of the public who were just getting used to the idea of a life lived online. That was the time when the internet was being talked about, the World Wide Web was coming out, and people were actually saying, we can make use of this in our daily lives and in, and in business. And if we're going to be using this in business, we're going to need to make sure that it's secure, because if I'm going to put in millions of dollars, and I'm going to have customer information or company information available to anybody over the net, I want to make sure it's available only to those people who I want it to be available to. Every one of us rely on computers in our everyday lives, transportation, banking, Wall Street. Somehow a computer touches us in everything we do. When we pick up the phone, it's a computer. And people, they don't, they're not familiar with the technology, think that it's just this mystical, magical thing that this guy out there that's public enemy number one can manipulate and, and, and bring everything crashing down. When the FBI finally caught up with public enemy number one, he was living in North Carolina under the pseudonym Tom Case. Right away I get on the telephone, I let my family know where I am because they had no idea that I was in North Carolina. I get a hold of my attorney Just a minute. and I let him know that I had the FBI at the door. I ended up like popping open the door just to crack to go well, who, who are you and right away the door pushes in and they go are you Kevin Mitnick I go no I said I'm Tom Case and 
Why are you guys in my house? Don't you check the mailboxes before barging in on somebody? I acted very naive and angry. I go, do you have a search warrant? And they go, well, if you're Kevin Mitnick, we do. I said, well, I'm not this guy Mitnick, so where's your search warrant? Eventually they said, well, we want to take you down to FBI headquarters and fingerprint you to see if you're this Kevin Mitnick or not. So I said, okay, absolutely. I said, just give me your card and tell me what time you want me to be there in the morning and I'll be there. And they go, no, we have, we want you to go down now. You know, we're not interested in having you show up later. They go arrest him, cuff him. And I was under arrest. Mitnick was back behind bars, this time facing 25 charges of computer and telephone fraud. The case was so complex that Mitnick would spend four and a half years in a cell before coming to trial. He was thrown in a county jail. He was actually beaten up. A lot of things were done to let Kevin know that the government was going to play hardball. The government made it clear that they might indict him in different jurisdictions, uh, that he might have to face multiple trials. He did not get the uh, evidence against him for a very long time. The only trial Kevin Mitnick got was in the New York Times and in the media. Mitnick stood accused of stealing $80 million worth of software from the companies he had hacked. In his defense, he laid claim to the hacker's ethos. Copying software was not theft. To do computer fraud or wire fraud, you have to deprive somebody of their money or property. Well, money wasn't an issue in my case, and property, when do you deprive somebody of property, making a copy, are you really depriving that person of it? So it's very, it gets murky. The government never alleged or was it ever proven that I intended to use or disclose that information? The information was the trophy. It was the, the, the proof of the hack. Mitnick may have been a folk hero for hackers, but others didn't see it like that. I think the terms of the game have changed dr dramatically, um, and uh, the kind of moral justification you could make for hacking, in a sense, that um, spirit really resonated well with an earlier world and I think it really is not possible to justify it today in the same way. In 1999, Mitnick was sentenced to five years in jail, most of which he had already served while awaiting trial. It was a longer sentence than that served by many killers. He was let out on supervised release early last year. So I'm under such stringent conditions of supervised release that if I were to touch this computer, I, can't, I would probably get sent back to federal prison. Kevin Mitnick may be banned from computers, but he can get together with his hacker heroes, Captain Crunch and Steve Wozniak. It's more sensationalist to, to make it sound like hackers are a fear to our, threat to our lives and our securities and our money and everything in the world. And people who don't understand curious minds, it's always going to be a group of bright kids that are a little bit technical and start looking beyond, you know, what if this, what if that? These pioneers find it hard to come to terms with hacking's outlaw status. But the world has changed, and all that's left are fond memories and relics of the good old days. Ah, uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, something like that. Does that bring back old memories? Uh, yes, it does. There's, you know, nothing I would trade for the success of Apple except that year I'd never give up. One year at Berkeley. And before that, yeah. there is a Captain Crunch whistle. Up next, join the Mad Boys of Pizza, followed by the antics of Kyle, Stan, Kenny and Cartman in South Park. <laughs>